Hi, Lena. <laughs> Hello. Um, do you want to start? Definitely. A very warm welcome to every one of you. It's a great pleasure to have you here um, tonight uh, on, on this new session. We are happy to welcome our speakers and our audience. Um, I would like to share my screen now and uh, show you a few few insights on today's meetup this is our 30 second uh, fintech and introtech meetup um, Matthias and Jan they uh, yeah, set this meetup up a couple or even more years ago. <laughs> Very successful in Cologne and Bonn. And uh, we switched uh, due to the course of Corona to a virtual event, an event that takes place in English and therefore open up uh, to the world. Um, and I'm happy uh, that people around the world, I, I saw someone joining us from Canada again, happy to have you here. Um, and so, yeah, talk about topics that um, interested us uh, within fintech scene. Um, let's introduce ourselves. Uh, Matthias, go ahead. Hi, I'm Matthias. I'm working in a day at an IT management consulting. And I also host a podcast for kind of, let's call it retail investors in, in Europe. And yeah, I'm also a um, member of the fintechweekly.com uh, website where we create content and uh, new developments in, in fintech and uh, finance. Yeah, and I also host the meetup, basically. That's it. Hi, um, again, from my side, I'm Lena. I'm a former fintech co-founder um, from Germany. Um, uh, had some time off uh, in a sabbatical, exited the company I co-founded and I'm now active as a mentor and a coach for startups, not only fintechs um, and involved uh, in product development at a, at a bank. Jan, I saw you with us tonight. Would you mind introducing yourself? Uh, yes, I'm on the road, obviously, sorry for that, but uh, hello, I'm Jan, I'm the guy running in background some stuff, so spreading the meetup, uploading videos, and I'm also co-founder of Fintech Weekly, and in my daily job, I'm a CEO of a web agency called Race Love here from Cologne, and we're also very addicted to Fintech stuff. That's cool, good you're with us, Jan. Um, the meetup will um, last until 8.30 p.m. ish. Um, uh, I kindly ask you if you're willing to, to uh, keep your videos on so we can see each other. It's a small, very down to earth round. Don't hesitate to put the video on. Um, please mute yourself um, so we are able to perfectly listen to our speakers and panelists. If you have any questions or have the uh, need to do remarks, please do so. Feel invited to do so via the Zoom chat. Um, we are recording um, this session to later on publish it on our YouTube channel. And as uh, Matthias said, also within his um, podcast. If you want to tweet uh, about this uh, meetup, feel free to do this. Um, use at fintechcgn to do so via Twitter. Tonight's topic is democratizing investing in alternative assets. Um, we have with us Selma from InVentures, Randy from Lendex, and Lena from Convi. As far as I know, all three are very early, early stage fintechs um, focusing on making alternative assets accessible um, for the normal, for the retail and not only for the high net worth individuals. And um, I'm happy to discuss these topics. Um, first, we will listen to their pitches. Uh, each might last up to 
10 minutes, five minutes to seven minutes, and then we'll have the chance to have a Q&A, mini Q&A after each pitch. Um, and then uh, following the three pitches, Matthias will moderate the panel, uh, discussing all open questions that uh, might be there around democratizing investing in alternative assets. So uh, I think we uh, will have the um, pitches going on uh, for the next half an hour and afterwards uh, the panel for a short hour uh, adding to that. And then we are happy to have an open ending networking again here. This is a small group. This is a down to earth meeting. We are happy um, to, to, to connect um, with you afterwards. So I think we should start, dive into the topic, democratizing investing in financial assets. And I'm happy to help have, have Zelma with us from InVentures. And Zelma, I'm, I'm happy if you would be so kind to share your screen, share your pitch, and we are excited to learn more about InVentures first. So, okay, can you hear me? Perfectly, go okay. ahead, so, the stage is yours. Okay, so hi everybody, my name is Selma. Um, I work at InVenture as a, as a growth manager. Um, it is a pleasure to, to introduce you or give you a glimpse into venture capital investments tonight. Um, so this is our small but very well-rounded team um, that wants to democratize venture capital investments. To give you a little more background on, on me, I have a finance background and gained experience in venture capital, investment banking, and social entrepreneurship. And the past two years, I actually worked at one of the biggest German tech startup hubs in, in, in Frankfurt, where I led um, innovation programs and scouting projects for clients such as the German Central Bank on, on, and also Deutsche Bank. And a couple of months ago, I actually decided to return back to the investment scene. Um, but uh, instead of returning into an existing system, I thought it would be much more exciting to challenge the current venture capital industry. Then I met, I, then I met Leonard uh, from InVenture and Fast Forward. My current role here at InVenture um, involves leading and developing the, the content strategy to educate retail investors on the topic of venture capital and also realizing now projects and partnerships to yeah, acquire more retail investors that want to invest over our platform. So as the event description probably already gave away, our uh, platform brings together VC funds and investors through the Inventor Investment Platform. Um, we, enable in, we enable retail investors to invest um, into venture capital, starting with small tickets from 2,500 euro by acquiring a blockchain-based financial product. So why did I say that 5,500 euro is low in, in the context of venture capital and what problems did we actually solve with our solution? So first, before our investment platform launched, it was only possible for very wealthy people to invest in venture capital funds. The German law requires a minimum investment sum of 200,000 euros to invest in venture capital uh, funds. That means you have to classify before law as a um, semi-professional or professional investor. And that's not feasible for retail, for the average retail investor. Second, um, more and more VC funds are looking for uh, more diverse sources of capital to fund startups, but currently it is too costly and complex for VC funds to consider retail investors um, as an affluent and new source of capital. That's why they still heavily rely on big institutional investors and also, um, for example, family offices. So the costly part we solve by creating a new digital asset using tokenization. But to allow retail investors to already participate with small ticket sizes in venture capital funds, um, we actually uh, pool, in venture pools the investments to meet the required minimum sum by the German investment code and then invest the money for the retail investors into the respective fund. 
In return, the retail investors um, acquire a, a digital security token, which grants them the rights to participate uh, at the returns from the fund. So retail investors benefit from small ticket sizes, um, high returns, ideally not guaranteed, and also the professional investment process and selection process for startups by the, the fund's investment team. On the other hand, um, VC funds benefit, uh, like actually have a new access to a new source of capital and also, at least we hope so, um, gain Inventure as a new uh, reliable partner for easier and further fundraising. So why now? There are a lot of reasons why now. Um, well, first of all, there are market dynamics, which most of us can't ignore anymore. And that's probably also the reason why most of us joined this meetup. Inflation, there is an increasing interest for alternative investments, but also there's a greater um, acceptance and adoption of blockchain technology in the financial industry. But venture capital is not only a very attractive asset class to investors. Um, it is also a very valuable source of funding for startups. There is evidence that VC-funded companies perform, grow faster compared to their peers. Startups um, generate new and, and faster jobs compared to the biggest 30 public companies in Germany. And lastly, there is actually a huge untapped potential of investment opportunities in venture capital. For example, um, the, the, the climate tech uh, financing opportunity in Germany for venture capital investments is estimated at 22 billion euros per year until 2030. So, um, well, our vision is pretty straightforward and ambitious. We want to become the number one marketplace in Europe for investment and venture capital. We want to make this asset cl class mainstream for retail investors by educating and informing them. And of course, we want to contribute to the positive impact by startups to society and economy. And while we are very proud how far we have come until now, we went live on the 20th of September as the first platform in Europe that provides retail investors access to venture capital. Um, our first fund on the platform is Planet A Venture, uh, a very high profile impact fund. And since then we had over 300 signups on our investment platform and raised over 200,000 euros. Um, yeah, we want to go live with a second fund before Christmas and um, have several other, uh, have several other um, funds also in the pipeline for next year and also want to uh, yeah, expand and improve the existing features that we have on our platform. So if you want to follow us on our journey or are even interested in investing over our platform, I invite you to follow our social media channels, subscribe to our newsletter or just connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I will post the links after the mini Q&A in the chat. Thank you for listening. Thanks, Selma. Great pitch. Thanks so much. We're keeping our fingers crossed for the second VC fund to, to be, um, <laughs> yeah, to, to co uh, cooperate with before Christmas. Um, I, as I also yeah, unfortunately, with unfortunately, VC funds are slow as well. <laughs> I thought only banks are slow. <laughs> no. Well, uh, thanks for the pitch. Um, let me see. Do we have questions in the chat? Um, feel free to raise the questions uh, in the chat. In the meantime, Zelma, you said that uh, you are the first platform in Europe. Um, what does that mean? Are there outside Europe uh, platforms already introduced? So, um, for example, um, I actually forgot the name, but Israel has a platform that um, raises also funds for venture capital firms, but the minimum investment requirement is higher than, than with us. Mm -hmm. um, there is also, uh, at least in the US, very well-known um, crowdfunding platform called Republic, for example. They also expanded, actually, now you can actually even, uh, yeah, participate in, in, in music stocks and so on. So they're like really creative and open-minded and they also um, they also opened up the possibility that people 
can uh, raise their funds over the platform. But yeah, we actually also have some direct competitors in Europe, which popped up after we launched, um, but they aren't live yet. So, yeah. Okay. Um, we have another question from Tama asking, um, well, first of all, saying thank you for the great presentation, <laughs> Tama. Uh, I totally agree. Um, his question is, how did you manage the AML and KYC requirements? So I'm not perfectly prepared for this question, but we actually work with different also IT providers and also um, a liability umbrella together, which controls and advises us on, uh, yeah, to comply with all the regulations and also help on also um, take over the whole AML and KYC process. But I think I will go a little bit more into depth with whom we work together in the panel later. Okay, and then another question from Wolfgang. Can user invest in the VC fund in a whole or in special startups of this fund? So um, you are not, or, or, I mean, right now it's only possible to, you're not investing in single companies over our platform. You're basically investing in a portfolio of companies which are selected by the VC fund. Maybe at some point in the future, we want to have, of course, more features, more possibilities, how you can participate um, at the growth of those startups. But um, our USP right now is actually that you that you can uh, invest in venture capital as a whole and not in single companies, because we received some even some feedback from some of our users that they find it more attractive to, to participate as a whole at venture capital, because they perceive it as much more risky and difficult to, yeah, yeah, um, judge if a single company is, uh, yeah, is a Worth it. is going to be a unicorn yeah. basically, yeah. and rather trust like an experienced um, yeah, venture capital firm. Yeah, cool. Um, let's take the last question. Can you confirm that you are pan European already? accepting funds from whole Europe? So um, we are, by law, we're just, uh, I mean, we can, uh, we can accept any funds. We can also accept international funds on our platform. Actually also international, uh, also international people who are not based in Germany can also invest over our platform. Cool, so very open up. Okay. Yeah, but uh, by German law, we are just allowed to advertise in Germany. So we're not allowed to go to the US or other European countries yet um, to basically yeah, sell our product um, mm -hmm. because we don't have certain licensing, which is very expensive right now for us. So yeah, we're currently growing more. Yeah, um, um, I forgot the word, but... Uh, we're, we're advertising and making a, trying to reach a wide audience, especially in Germany, with our content strategy partnerships and so on. Yeah, cool. I see that uh, Victoria has further questions. Maybe you can connect via LinkedIn. Um, I'll, I'll yeah. share Selma's profile in a second. Um, but I would like to um, proceed uh, with Randy. For now, thanks, Selma. And great to see you back in the panel in a few minutes. Randy, um, it's cool to have you here and um, I'm happy you're introducing Lendix um, as far as I know also quite early stage. Um, happy to That's listen true. to your pitch, your stage is yours Randy. That's true, um, can I share the screen as well Liam? That should be possible. Okay, got it. Just give me a second and tell me if you can see it. Yes, now it just needs to be full screen and we're with you. you. Thanks, go ahead. Yes, um, first of all, it's a huge pleasure to, to participate in this, um, in this discussion and, and to share the stage with, with talented and, and great people. Um, my name is Randy, um, I'm from Estonia um, and, and, um, and I've been dealing with investments from pretty, pretty young age. I started investing when I was 16 it's been now seven years, um, past four years, I've been, um, I've been giving financial literacy um, 
seminars and workshops all around Estonia. And one of my mission has been that every young person in Estonia um, is, um, can have a financial education um, and, and you know, really improve the climate uh, that we have here. And uh, you know, it's, it's very positive that past five years, uh, we've seen a tremendous growth um, happening in Estonian investment uh, uh, landscape. So it's, it's my, my pleasure. And I never thought that investing can become a part of my, uh, my daily job because you know I was a professional footballer, then I went to the university, did a lot of projects, um, established uh, many companies, even exited one, um, started in investment clubs and, and so on and so on. But then I ended up with the Landex. Um, and let me give you the story behind the Landex as well. Like I said, that the past four years, I've been also giving seminars all around Estonia. And what I noticed is, 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 is something very, very interesting that whenever I went to talk about investments, you know, I, I went to talk about how to start investing, why to start investing, you know, giving the basics of, of the investments. And, uh, and um, there was like 90% of people that could understand the stocks, around 95% people that can understand the real estate. But theoretically, there was this one asset class that everybody could understand, and it was land. And... Um, and uh, like why I said theoretically, because, you know, if you go into more details, uh, talking about pony debt calculations or evaluation models, obviously it's harder. But for me, the land as an asset class broke even the grandma rule. So whenever I, I spoke to my grandma about the land investment, she could understand. She's over 80 now um, and, and, and she could understand, but she can't understand any stocks or anything. And it was very, very interesting for me since you know talking about different asset classes um, trying to create an environment for the beginner or for the for someone that's uh, that wants to invest but we don't have land as an asset class we don't have that option we have the we have the option for the high net worth individuals and then we uh, started looking into more of it and we understood that you could be very bad investor that's uh, Estonian statistics. You can be very bad investor and still earn up to 16% on average um, annually. And what does that mean is, is um, we wanted to be a part of it since we were also investors. And then we gathered the team together. We started doing the research and we found out that there's no access to land investments. What I mean by the access is I'm going to talk about the, the product more as well. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going to give you one more slide about the uniqueness of land. Estonian land hasn't had any volatility for the past 10 years. Um, here you could see, uh, on, on the last slide here, you can see this is 10 year total yearly returns. On 20 years, uh, in 20 years time, you could earn uh, 20, uh, sorry, 38 times your, uh, your money back. So. The returns are crazy. Of course, we are a post-Soviet area. We're post-Soviet uh, geographically positioned as a post-Soviet um, area, but, uh, but that's not uh, only happening in Estonia. So what is Landex? We, we created the product pretty quickly. Why? Um, like, first of all, I'm going to talk about the team as well. We did the product in six months. We put it on the market and we wanted to see what's going to happen. Now we've been live for eight weeks and then um, and, and I'm going to talk about the traction again uh, as well. But those eight weeks has been very, very successful for me. So Landex is an investment platform or marketplace where everyone can easily invest in farm and forest land. And um, what I mean by easily is you can start investing in land with as low as 10 euros. And that's the uniqueness of it. At the moment, if you want to become a land investor, you know, you have to have, I don't know how's the things in, in, in your country, in Germany or wherever, in Estonia, if you want to buy, you know, a decent land, it costs minimum 10,000 euros. Um, doing crowdfunding, doing it on crowdfunding model helps us to fractionalize land and, and you can become a, a, a land owner 
with as low as 10 euros. This is not the only thing that we, uh, we saw that's missing on the land market. Also liquidity. It's a super important aspect when it comes down to the uh, investments. Uh, I'm also an angel investor myself. And whenever I do those angel investments, you know, I can get stuck for 10 years, but that's not the case with Landex and that's not the case with land because we created a secondary market there. And, and it's, been, uh, it's been surprisingly popular without doing any marketing. Uh, so people can trade even their land. Now about the team, um, this is the operation side. This is the management side. So as, as, I, as I told, um, I've been talking about and consulting people on financial literacy and investments for, for now past four years. I've been grading, uh, I've been in the real estate business and I've been grading um, um, a companies before, but, um, but I, I'm not the only one that's building the company. Uh, I also have Gemel and Jan with me, especially Jan, who's uh, ex, uh, ex, um, ex Barclays, um, Barclays investment banker, but he's the first person in Estonia to start uh, um, a private uh, carbon uh, project company. So we're going to talk about uh, the carbon uh, in, in a little bit time as well. But what's what we are more important? What, what's more important? What we are more proud of is is the top advisors and and co-founders that we have. We have a co-founders of uh, of Estate Guru, which is a pan-European and, and leading uh, real estate loan company. We have a, we have a co-founder of Pandora. Uh, also, they're focusing on the on the loans. They've been uh, uh, they've been uh, they've been finance. Uh, Sorry, they've been uh, they've been funded uh, more than half uh, half a billion uh, euros worth of loans. Again, that's not the only thing we have in a team. Mart Eric and and Lees, who are the the top people when it comes down to the land and land management. Mart Eric himself he manages around twenty five thousand hectares of land in Estonia, and he's one of the most uh, most known guy. Klaus helping us with the German market. Phil. Andre Ivar uh, and, and some other people that's behind it. Uh, but that's not the whole team. The whole, I would say, team behind it is around 15, 20 people. Um, and the market trends, like why we are doing what we are doing is um, we are in a unique position where there's more retail investors than ever. Also, you know, the tremendous growth be behind the alternative asset classes, also not only um, retail investors are, are more interested about it. You know, in the US, they say that the alternative asset classes are, you know, real estate, venture, uh, sorry, private equity, and, and so on. But for me, alternative asset classes are, are, are land, are baseball cards, are, you know, collectibles, whatever. So there's, we, we've seen a huge growth uh, behind, the alternative, uh, behind the alternative asset classes. Also, fractionalization is, is going mainstream. And why I say that is when I, when I started uh, investing seven years ago, the, the lowest amount I could invest in Estonia was around 500 euros because the fees and, you, you know, whenever you wanted to have, wanted to participate in some projects, you know, it, it was even more expensive. But now when we fractionalize um, assets, it's, it's becoming more, accessible for everyone. Um, and what we are doing actually here is we're creating another asset class. So Landex is, is about, you know, having a best store of value because it's an inflation hedge product. Uh, we have yield investments. We have the yield uh, there as well. So investors earn money in, in two ways. They earn money via the um, price appreciation and they can sell your positions. Think of it like a stock market. You buy some stock and you can sell it on the, on, on the market. Um, and we're giving governmental data uh, on, on quarterly basis, how much your land has, uh, has gone up. Also, we do our own predictive analytics about, about each land. Um, and also they can earn money when, it, when it's uh, farmland, they can earn money from the farmer. Uh, yield, uh, yields are, or rents are around two to 3% a year, uh, which is not a lot, but you know, it's, it's still something. Um, 
they can earn money from subsidies and uh, EU grants. Um, for, for instance, we have a protection area and in, in that protection area, we're getting uh, 520 euros per hectare uh, EU grant, which also goes to the, which also goes to the, to the investors. And, and the one main thing that's now becoming uh, that as, as, you know, as Landex, we don't want to just to be a marketplace. What we want to be is we want to be much, much bigger than that. We're talking about the carbon capture here now as well. You can invest in forest land or in a carbon project that uh, starts to earn or starts to capture carbon. And that carbon will be sold and you can earn uh, money through that as well. So you have... We, what we did with land, we basically took out of everything. We, we, uh, you're going to earn money through price appreciation and, and on, on yield. So, and the size of, of the opportunity is, is here as well. So basically that's, the, that's what we need to become a unicorn. There is no such companies in the EU. That's, that's pretty funny. There, there are some um, comparables. I'm not saying even competitors, but comparables in the US because in the US market, you can't fractionalize land like that. But, uh, but we're in the right timing. Um, maybe about the, about the product roadmap as well. Like I said, uh, we've been live for eight weeks now. Uh, it, was, it was pretty rough, um, pretty rough product that we, we put on the market because we're testing all the time. I wanted to talk about also the uniqueness of, the, you know, of land investments. At the end of the day, we don't know what our investors want. We only know that they want to invest in land, but what kind of land? So it was very good to see that whenever we put uh, different uh, lands on, on the market, um, one farmland, one forest land, one biodiversity land, they all got funded successfully. So that means that investors do, do not only care about commercial forest land, commercial farmland, but they also care about sustainability. And that's becoming now a huge, huge aspect of Landex that we are starting a Landex Green that's basically um, about reforestation projects, that's about uh, carbon projects, that's about uh, co converting commercial lands to the protection areas as well. And, uh, and that's one key part uh, investing in Landex. Um, and about the progress as well, I, I thought it's, you know, maybe it's interesting to see how we are doing. So currently we have two listings live, but we have many more in the pipeline. Uh, since we are doing all the, all the due diligence for the lands, the lands come in, we do all the evaluation process, we do all the risk matrices, and we give some kind of a rating and put it on the, our marketplace. Um, we have over 700 users by now. We have over 60,000 euros deposited, uh, sorry, invested and over 75K deposited. That's, I would say, pretty successful start since, uh, uh, you know, as we are 90% Estonian, uh, Estonian market-based uh, company at the moment because our marketing budget was very low. We are at the moment uh, having another fundraising. So um, we're in the, in the middle of the process. So, and that's about the Landex. Uh, I think there is a lot of uh, things that I would uh, like to tell you more about the, about the team. But as I want to wrap it up now is, um, and, and leave you with one message is, uh, is, is Landex is so much more than just the investment marketplace. We are creating an access to a unique and one of the oldest asset classes. You know, it's very emotional asset class. A lot of uh, nations have, uh, have, uh, have had like very hard times uh, uh, because of wars, because people are fighting for the, for, the, for, the, for the land. And at the same time, land is something that they will never produce more. This is it, like this is the land that we have uh, but we are growing in uh, need of resources. We are growing of need in housing where uh, population is growing. So land is something that will go more, uh, will be more expensive. Uh, the difference between Estonian, uh, Finnish and Swedish market is that the Estonian uh, land prices for the same quality land is around two uh, to three times cheaper, but we are like 200, 500 kilometers apart. Uh, and that's the, that's the current situation. So. Um, we're currently operating in Estonia. You can download the app on App Store, Play Store, try it out yourself, give us some feedback. Uh, we're going to have a web version coming up in, in like 20 days, so feel free to, to use it. But like I said, if you want to become a shareholder of Landex, we're having a funding campaign on Fundwise, so feel free to do it as well. 
Uh, I'm going to leave you the info at landex.ai contact, but you can always uh, text me on, on LinkedIn as well. So That's great, uh, thank you and uh, feel free to ask questions. Thanks, Randy. What an enthusiastic pitch here. Super, yeah. super cool to listen to and really um, got me into the topic uh, just by your enthusiasm talking about land and, and uh, not just marking it as a uh, investment uh, market. That's super cool. I like the storyline. Um, you mentioned that it's, uh, uh, it used to be a minimum investment of 10,000 uh, euros if you wanted to invest into land. What's the average investment uh, sum that uh, individuals invest now? With Currently them? on our marketplace, um, our average customer is 35 year old male that's investing 140 years uh, on average per mm -hmm. investment. So um, yes, we see a difference between, because we have uh, Klaus has done an amazing job on, on German customers as well, that German and, and Estonian um, uh, customers are, are a bit different. You know, Estonians, since it's not so developed uh, investment uh, climate uh, here in, 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 in Estonia, they are more trying out, you know, they're, they're investing like 10 euros, they're investing like 20 euros, but whenever we see some Belgium uh, or German uh, joining the marketplace, their investment amount are, are, are much bigger. So uh, mm -hmm. I think it's probably gonna change. It's not gonna stay at one, 140 euros. I think it's going to be more higher. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing is that we, I also want to mention about the, the, the thing that we are actually facing. Uh, it's not a problem, but I would say it, it's an obstacle that whenever we do marketing, we don't start with Landex. We start educating people that they start to think that land can be an asset class. So that's also a very unique position where we need to start educating people that hey land is an asset class and it's mm -hmm. amazing asset class so randy yeah randy we have more questions from the audience and Sorry. i really have to keep the time Sorry. here in mind I didn't see i'll that. pick one more question and then for the other questions yeah. um and please uh, please just join us after the panel or maybe uh, matthias can involve this in the panel yep. um one more question is how does carbon partnerships or carbon in general benefit your business model and your clients so it, it benefits um, in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, getting, um, we, we call it scorps. It's, you know, it's a bad, bad word, but whenever, uh, you know, trees are cut, um, those lands are sold so much cheaper at the moment in the, in the market. We can get the prime premium land for let's say 2,500 euros an hectare. Before it was mature, mature uh, forest, it, it, it's like 4,000, 5,000 euros an hectare. So we're getting it much cheaper, which allows, uh, and we're doing the reforestation project there, um, which allows for investors to earn much more money as well. So we have the partnership with, uh, with Project Spruce, uh, with a company that's, uh, that's organizing everything we need uh, when it comes down to the reforestation. And we are starting to, uh, there are distri dis distributed dis distributors, uh, that are willing to buy your rights for the carbon five years, 10 years. So we are willing to sell our even our carbon rights uh, up front. So that's how it's, uh, and, and people are earning money by, by selling those, uh, those carbon rights. Um, and for the business, I mean, it's a huge thing for the marketing as well. Um, ESG, you know, uh, saving, the, saving the world kind of. Um, are, are the are the things that I would like to Definitely. you know point out? Thanks, Randy. Thanks a lot. Um, as time is running by, and we are all excited for the panel, um, Randy. Thanks a lot, and I have yep. Lena invited to join me on stage here. Uh, Lena, it's a pleasure to meeting uh, you today um, and having you on stage, um, introducing to us Convi. Um, I think even even more early stage than the other ones, at least uh, regarding the launch date, right? I just saw it a couple of days ago that you launched the, uh, your app. Um, welcome to stage and happy to listen to your pitch. Thank you so much, Lena, and also very happy to be here. I'm quickly gonna try to share my screen. It's always 
we have our presentation in Keynote, which means Keynote works and Zoom out. Perfectly. Are Don't worry, it works <laughs> perfectly. You can go ahead. Okay, perfect. So, yes, very, very happy to be here and introduce Convi. Yes, we only launched very recently, but the apps are actually live already for six months. So we've been working on this already for a while. And yeah, I'm Lena. I'm one of the co-founders of Convi. And Convi is a European-wide platform that allows investments, investments into alternative assets, such as collectibles like fine art, watches, wine, and even handbags. And Convi was actually founded during the COVID pandemic, as we realized as founders how important a well-diversified investment portfolio is, because many people suffered during the stock market crash in 2020, since they put all their eggs into one basket, so mainly the stock market. Um, but alternative assets are actually crucial for a well-diversified portfolio, and there's two reasons for that. One, that they are uncorrelated to mainstream assets and in general also have a very low volatility in times of crisis. And then also secondly, they do provide higher returns that can even outperform the stock market overall. The whole problem with alternative assets such as collectibles is however, that um, they are only for the reach for high net worth individuals at the moment or like very wealthy people. So they are practic practically out of reach for the average retail investor. And that is because one, they are super scarce and inaccessible, and more importantly, because the so-called investment grade collectibles, meaning those that are able to appreciate highly in value are super expensive. So it's usually not actually the, the 10K Rolex that, um, that, is the best, that, that is the best watch for investment, but the sweet spot for investment grade watches lays between 200 and 250,000 euros. So this is, practically out of reach for the average investor, especially if we consider that you should only put around 10 to 15% into alternatives out of your whole portfolio. And this is why we developed Convi. So Convi is a platform that allows anyone to invest into alternative assets, which generate up to 20% return per annum based on the historical average returns from our partners. And users on our platform can do so with just 250 euros minimum stake. And uh, the asset specialists that we're working with, with Convi, um, are thoroughly verified before they are able to open their doors to small retail investors. So at the moment, users can invest into a rare watch of 250,000 euros in col collaboration with an existing fund or existing partner that is out there um, called the Watch Fund. And the Watch Fund is basically a watch specialist based in Singapore with more than 60 million assets under management. And as I said before, their usual clients are high net worth individuals, um, among which are actually also a few uh, national soccer players from Europe. Um, but because their minimum investment is $250,000, um, they have never been accessible for the small retail investor before. And um, another partner we are already working with is Kaltwines. So Kaltwines is um, a globally leading fine wine portfolio manager that also has more than 200 million British pounds and assets under management. And if you want to kind of invest in a wine portfolio with them, you have uh, to kind of meet the minimum stake of at least 10,000 British pounds to even 25,000 British pounds. And these are basically the partners that, ex that exist, that are out there that have a very strong track, track, strong track record over time, but um, have been very exclusive for very wealthy people. And we kind of help them open their doors for the average retail investor. And in the future, we have a lot more alternative investment specialists in, um, in our on, or planned on our roadmap to also cover some other asset classes such as art, handbags, whiskey, collectible cars, and uh, you name it. Um, in our early days, so as Lena said before, we officially launched just, I think, two weeks ago. Um, we have already seen very high demand um, from Generation Z and Millennials. We did have the apps live already since April, so we were already having a lot of users on the platform, did a lot of experiments, but we did not allow them to invest in um, the, the assets already, so we did not accept any, any money at that point. So the official launch date was two weeks ago, and on that day alone, we um, had 
um, orders of two of 24,000 euros on the platform just on that day on that day alone. And um, previously, from the users we already had on the platform, they fully reserved the initial offering of that watch of 250,000 just in reservations. And uh, with Conry itself, we are able to target to the whole or target the whole EEA area, which means um, on our platform, the users that have already invested, they are actually super diverse. And uh, from the investors, we already have 14 EEA countries represented, which is pretty cool. But overall, the targets, the target markets that we want to focus on are actually Germany and Italy. So why? Why did we create Convi and what makes Convi actually the platform that we as founders have missed as retail investors when we came up with the idea? First of all, we are a CO2 neutral platform since day one, basically also since day zero. So we've been CO2 neutral before we actually launched. Secondly, we allow financial diversification from just 250 euros. Third, we are um, partnering with world leading experts that have um, historical returns of up to 20% per annum. Fourth, we um, ensure safe storage and insurance of all items. And finally, we are also regulated um, with the Irish, Irish Central Bank. And if users invest into an, asset, into an asset round and that asset is not funded within three months, they get a 100% refund. Um, and then also a quick glance into our team and who we are as a founding team. So I co-founded Convi with Joanna and Aaron, and uh, we are a team with very strong technical marketing and scaling experience from big tech companies such as Facebook, now Meta, or Shopify, um, but also startups like Medring. And uh, some of our trusted advisors, so we do have a lot of them, but they <laughs> didn't fit all on the, on the slide. So I only picked three of them. So we are trusted by APX, which is the VC by Axel Springer and Porsche. And then also have uh, um, backers and advisors such as Mo, who was a previous general manager at Shopify, and also Amir, who's the CCO at CallSign, which is a FinTech unicorn. And then uh, what's next for Convi? So what do we what do we plan for the future? Um, this year, we have already democratized watch investments with the first watch offering through the watch fund, which is currently open on the platform. Um, we are already accepting pre-orders slash uh, reservations for the fine wine portfolio with Kalt Wines that we will open up next year fully for investments. Um, then we are also building our liquidity solution. Um, which will be potentially in the form of a secondary market to allow all our users to exit their investment even before the end of a holding period, because all investments do have a predefined holding period. And then throughout the next years, we will also scale into a lot more asset classes. And um, in the long term, we are also um, considering in-house sourcing of assets and um, deploy Convi index funds in partnerships with trading platforms while taking over the global market. So this journey at this beginning is uh, only 1% done. And um, yeah, this is basically a quick glance into Convi, Convi in a nutshell. And um, there's much more I think about Convi, but I guess um, we don't have that much time and we're going a bit more into depth during the panel. Very, but thanks so much. Very, very, thank, thank you, Lena. Very, very nice presentation on the point, I'd say. Very cool. Um, we have one question from the audience, which I would like to pick and um, ask you. Um, the question is, how attached are clients to individual assets? For example, the watch. Is there any attachment, so to say? Yeah, so um, there is, you know, this distinction between watch collectors and watch investors. Like if you're a collector, you want to have the watch and feel and you, you really want to, you know, have and own the asset then you're super attached. And if you're only an investor, so you use this to diversify your portfolio, this is something where people are not as attached, but obviously it is an emotional asset class. So we try to help them get the attachment through a few hacks that will be launched in the future. Um, one example is, for example, they can see a live stream of the, of the offering um, like the whole time, and there will be much more hacks coming so that they at least kind of feel that ownership a little bit but purely it's an investment, so they won't be able to wear it or anything. Okay, thanks a lot. 
Matthias, I already uh, took more time than we agreed upon. I'm happy to forward the word on to you and have you moderate our panel now with all three speakers who all did great pitches. Um, go ahead, starting the panel. Uh, let's maybe take a 30 seconds of silence to put the right pictures to the um, Zoom meeting. So I will select also Randy. Um, I select also who else is here? Who else is here? Or can you do that, Elena? Do you feel? I can do it too. Or? Um, I will put myself. Just that it looks good on YouTube. <laughs> um, Selma. And there was somebody else. Let me check. Ah, no, that was. That's everybody. Good, yeah, fine. Uh, um, I, I think I will um, I will go for the wine then um, if, if I join Lena's investment. Um, so what we would like to talk about in the panel discussion is uh, I think we focus on uh, alternative assets and democracy or how it is de democratized. And um, basically I start with a simple question uh, because I uh, moderating, uh, I think I moderate like Uh, single interviews like a couple of years, but never talk to three people at the same time, uh, not even at work. So um, basically, where are you from? So where I've seen that Convi, is it from Romania or is somebody of Convi coming from Romania? Uh, my co-founder, Joana, is originally from Romania, but we're all based in Berlin. We're all living in Berlin and have a small office even in Berlin. Wow, an office. That's really vintage that you have said. And um, Selma, where, where are you based? So we're as well based in Berlin, the cliche. Okay. Uh, we are actually um, part of the Humboldt University Incubator program. So we have also an office a little bit outside of Berlin, you could say. So Adlershof? Uh, or Ex where? Exactly. We are okay. in, in Adlershof. Okay. So it will be difficult to drink a coffee with Lena because it's... Uh, 45 minutes away. Um, and Rennie, you also maybe have to move to Berlin then because I think it's everybody's doing it. Every band and every startup is moving to Berlin. Um, yeah. And um, so I would like to start maybe talking about uh, democ democracy. So first of all, why we, do we have to democratize assets? Isn't it good that just a few can invest in it? Or why do the other people also have to invest in these kind of assets? Um, so what makes, um, so how is it, um, the, the, the whole um, investing or crowd investing, how is it, how is the democratization working? So what are the drivers of this doc, um, um, democratization? Maybe starting with Randy, because I remember his uh, new, new trend of fractionalization that we also see maybe on Robin Hood or in NFTs and so on. So what kind of drivers do you see for that? democratization of, of, of assets. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, first of all, alternative investments are, are booming. That's, that's the first thing. Another thing is that there are more in, investors in the world than, than, than there's ever been. And when there are a lot of beginners, that's what I, uh, what I see in the Estonian market. Um, When there are a lot of beginners, they usually don't start with you know thousands of euros. Estonian income level is also is also slow, is also lower. Uh, I'm giving you the perspective on on, on Estonia at the moment. Uh, so people want to try out and they want to participate in the in the asset classes that they really you know understand and care about. So I have a lot of friends that started investing like one or two years ago. But they don't want to invest in stocks. But you know, stocks is always been. If, if you think of investments, you always think of stocks. You always think of the stock markets and those crazy crafts. But people have understood that they don't. They like something else, uh, and and with that, uh, a lot of like different asset classes have gone through fractionalization uh, process because you know some of them have been, uh, you know didn't have an access, for instance, like land or collectibles or even like uh, investing in equity. So I think it's a very interesting times uh, that we are seeing at the moment and, and the fractionalization is happening uh, just be because people see um, and, and know where they would like to invest. And if there's in enough demand, 
you know, uh, and no access, there's a lot of people that can come up with uh, something in innovative and, and, and that's what we are seeing at the moment. So Selma, and uh, what do we think is driving this um, trend to the di democratization of in investing? Um, what have you maybe observed? Uh, what, what trends maybe um, also the digital technologies and so on that? Yeah, so maybe, maybe first of all, I researched uh, a number uh, oh, that I good. let's just uh, uh, yeah throw into the onto the panel round. Um, so the, I mean the 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 crowdfunding interest industry and or the I mean the online market for alternative assets. It, it's it's a, like a pretty early market. It started evolving like in the 2012s, 2013s, and I actually found out that the online alternative finance market size grew from 65 million euros in 2013 to over 1.3 billion in 2020. So I think this is a clear indicator that we currently, especially this year, have a, have a momentum of uh, that people get more familiar with alternative assets. Um, and that's also nice for us since we all fit into this momentum with our business models. But I also mentioned the increasing acceptance and application of blockchain technology in the financial markets. And for example, in 2018, the startup Bitbond was the first uh, blockchain company ever that uh, got the permission of the German financial authorities to actually issue digital securities. And this also like paved the way for, for startups like, like us. And um, yeah, we also did like for we also did a, a survey um, on our social media channels, and eighty percent of our audience also want to like increase, um, diversify their portfolio um, towards alternative assets. So I think there's like right now a lot of uh, momentum that people are actually more interested taking responsibility for their finances and diversifying their portfolios, but also technologies such as blockchain, techno uh, such as blockchain or, or the usage of tokenizations make it, make, makes it possible for startups like us to also offer attractive and cheap services to, to retail investors to, to make this also possible. And mm -hmm. that's everything that like, makes democratization progress faster than ever before. Yeah, it's a it's a hard word. Interesting uh, is this number. I have to re research it if it's really valid because it's a. So, um, it's it's um. I usually trust Statista, so okay. you can pick up Statista. Okay, Statista. Okay, um, uh, Lena, do you have anything to add about this uh, democratization? Why it is uh, happening and how? Yeah, yeah. So I think there is like actually you know two main factors, which is like one uh, that this whole democratization trend is also coming you know due to the fact that a lot of young people are starting investing a lot of very young like there's this huge wave of young investors also from the us with robin hood etc so young people want to get their finances in their own hands which is amazing and i think this trend like you know also with female investors etc so it's great that finances are not a topic that's only um important for wealthy people anymore but at the same time young people are not able to invest like large amounts, amounts of, of money in uh, in certain asset classes, which means this forces a lot of asset classes to become more um, accessible for, for younger investors. And um, then the second part is also the whole trend of fractionalized shares, which is very related to that. And um, a few years ago, I think you could still only buy a whole stock. So you could only buy like a whole Tesla stock or something. And now you can just like buy or invest in a Tesla stock with a euro just to buy like part of it, a share of, a share of it. And I think this is like what really educates and creates this boom in a lot of asset classes to think about okay how can we make ourselves more accessible for that for that um, younger audience and um, then democratize the, the the asset class isn't this with a younger audience um, because i started um, crowd investing in 2011 and then there came kind of new platforms equity based crowd investing platforms and there was a statistic, and they they rarely rarely have statistics. Um, so I'm talking about Cedars or the German platforms like um, Companisto or Seedmatch, and they have like a six six percent. I hope I'm not lying, Klaus. Um, they have like six percent return. Uh, so I even wait for a couple of them to um, yeah to 
send me the money or to um, for the exit. So I have the feeling um, that uh, with that experience maybe of the past, so I I moved to more secure asset classes, so like classic stocks and maybe derivatives a bit, or Bitcoin, which is also getting old slowly. Um, so I, I think maybe they they uh, this new bunch of investors that is like the is it millennial what comes after millennial generation? Yeah. How's it called? Gen Z. Gen yeah, Z. maybe they haven't um, they haven't experienced um, a downturn in the market. So I think the last uh, side where um, the market where the markets go side where was like 2015 to 18, and then it went just up. So I think maybe um, I have the feeling that I hear uh, or hear everywhere about um, stock tips in the mainstream media about how they can invest in alternatives and so on. So I think maybe if there is a bear market, they just disappear again or I don't know. Do you think there's uh, a little bit too much euphoria in the in the market right now, or do you think it's healthy? I okay. personally think um, that because like we actually had like a small stock stock market crash in 2020, you know, with the COVID, um, with the COVID market crash, and I think this is something like as like that actually made us create Convi, and this was something I think where a lot of people realized, okay, it's not good enough to put everything in ETFs or stocks. Like you have to diversify and you should not, you know, all your assets shouldn't be all super correlated with mainstream assets. And mm. um, yeah, so that's, I think, one of the drivers right now where people look for diversification and diversification comes then if you should like put 20% uh, or up to 20% into alternatives um, and you only have a whole portfolio of 10K, it's only 2K and then like, what can you do with 2K? It's limited, right? Especially if uh, the the fractional share thing would not be a, a reality. Yeah, you, maybe you can't. Yeah, you can't buy an Amazon stock uh, for that money. I think. I'm not sure. Um, yes, Emma. Um, maybe to to add to to Lena. Um, mm -hmm. I actually agree. There is probably a hype, and I think the hype will also go on, and there will be probably a couple of more convies and inventors. Um, in, in the future, but I think the, the real winners or the winner companies also are going to be those who really select the most qualified products or funds that are showcased as investment opportunities on this platform and who also educates and informs their retail investors the best. Because um, I, I personally believe um, democratization of finance or to exclusive asset classes will continue and is important, but should all should just take place if you properly educate and inform your customer base. And I think that's also like the responsibility uh, of myself, of Lena, and also of um, mm. um, everyone else. So you're talking about uh, building trust with your customers um, so that they, yeah, kind of, I mean, they, they rely on your due diligence because kind of I, as a retail investor, outsource my due diligence and the selection of assets to, to your apps, basically. So I need uh, to have trust um, um, and so on. Yeah. Um, and would you also say that the people are already kind of um, have the feeling that the scarce, scarcity, scarcity, that um, an asset needs to be scarce? Uh, because of that, maybe inflation and so on, um, and um, printing money that they're really looking for things that cannot be replicated like land or like a bottle of wine. Um, do you think that is already um, there in the mind of mainstream people or not? Can you repeat the last part of the question? Yes. Um, so do you, do you think this is already in the um, mind of the mainstream people? Um, that they need to look for um, scarcity of the assets uh, and not like kind of, I mean, a stock could, they could increase the, the amount of stocks and so on, um, or uh, coins, you even can increase the amount of coins. I, I think, especially you with your um, solution, Renny, uh, land, it's pretty hard to replicate it. Um, I, mean, I mean, maybe on Mars, but not on Earth, I would say. I hope it's, do you think it's, um, they ask for um, the scarce assets or is it not the driver of demand for you? I, I, I think that people now start to understand and, and I hope through our marketing and our education, people will start more understand that land is something or 
even the collectibles are something that you can't you know produce anymore it's 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 out there but i i think overall the situation i think people are not really thinking about it uh, it like so so that's just that's just purely based on the feedback that i've uh, i've gathered you know throughout those uh, eight nine months that i've been uh, dealing with landex that when i take landex as an example people still need to uh, people still need to get used to it so and 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 you know it's it's a, it i would say it can take up to you know 5 or 10 years that people really start to think that you know land for instance is a unique um it's like you know nft but uh, but i think we have a long way to go there mm. Um, and also, I think in the, in the Bitcoin or in the yeah, crypto community, I think they really have in mind the scarcity because some of the main gurus like Michael Saylor, they are really uh, um, talking a lot about the scarcity. And also in, in this crypto um, currency, they also often burn coins. So then you have fewer amount of coins and then it can become maybe more valuable like uh, i think the binance coin has burned some of the coins and also other ones that i'm can't remember <laughs> um anyway so i would like to uh, head over to an, another topic um now is in inflation because it's everywhere in media so you can for example have uh, uh, you need to look for a secure store of value like um, hopefully bitcoin which is more volatile than than land um obviously um would you say that this is also driving kind of demand for for your um, um, companies and for your offerings, um, Lena? Uh, yes, for sure. So I think, I mean, the inflation we see right now that is also like, I think, strongly um, caused by the COVID pandemic is like really um, causing people to realize they cannot just leave their money on the bank because leaving money on a bank account with zero um, with zero um, interest or even negative interest rates is just you know not feasible. So they will just lose against inflation for sure. And I think this is like now um, this huge trend of a lot of first time investors that even like from every age that just think, okay, now is the time to actually get my finances going and to not just leave it on the on the bank. And um, then usually, I guess the most first time investors start with ETFs, start with, with stocks. Um, but then having in mind that there can be like a, another market crash, there can be, you know, some volatility in the market, especially in uncertain times now, because we still have the COVID pandemic ongoing. And that's what drives them then to diversify again. And diversification is what I think is interesting for all of our asset classes like land, VC or um, collectibles, because these are very good assets to diversify just because they have a low correlation with the mainstream assets. Maybe not necessarily startups, but especially land and, um, and physical assets. And then obviously, like you shouldn't put all your money in these collectibles, but this is a way to diversify. And I think this is what helps us as Conby currently with the trend to cover this um, this demand. Sure. Um, yeah. Um, everything you said is is, is correct, and and uh, I definitely agree on that. But uh, I can also give you now a very um, a very active perspective on what's happening in Estonia. So basically, past 10, uh, 12 years, the real estate prices in Tallinn, which is the capital of Estonia, has gone up from 800 euros per square meter to average 3000 euros per square meter. And we can see extremes 5000 euros per square meter. So um, in like society and uh, like people are talking about inflation in Estonia, like everything, everyone are going crazy that we will have like six, 7% uh, of in inflation rate. And, you know, just keeping your money on the bank account, you're gonna you're gonna lose a lot of money in, in in the long term. So a lot of people are actually not investing in land or not in collectibles, but they're investing in real estate because it's a physical asset. They can see that, they can touch that, and uh, and, uh, and 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 that's why we are actually booming at the moment in, in the in the real estate uh, market. So I hope there comes a time when people can understand that 
you know, real estate is very hot at now. And uh, like Lena mentioned that, you know, there, there can be some situations where uh, there's going to be some crash or, you know, things are not going to, you know, rise uh, forever and they will start looking into land. So obviously land is also inflation hedge asset and, uh, and, and uh, is, is a very, very good uh, alternative on real estate. But, uh, but inflation is playing a big role on also on our customers that people just don't want to leave the money on the bank account and they are willing to invest. Um, um, would you say, um, maybe just taking out the crystal ball, um, if you have one, <laughs> uh, how long will um, in the inflation uh, occur or will be there with us? Is it just a short-term phenom phenomenon? I've heard maybe you can you can lower the prices again using technology. There are these supply chain issues. Um, is it maybe just because of COVID or it, yeah? I, I mean, if you have more goods produced in Europe uh, because of protection protectionism um, and not in China, maybe it's yeah it's getting more and more expensive. I've just seen my gas uh, invoice. Uh, it's a kind of thirty uh, percent more. Um, would you say this continues or what would be or is it ending hopefully in one or two years have you read something about it in the internet or the gurus you follow yeah um actually um, since estonia is so small we only have 1.3 million people and i mm. ended up having a dinner with the president of estonian bank and then we had a we had a talk about uh, the inflation rates mm -hmm. and he he said or confirmed me that the uh, next three years we're gonna experience around uh, four to seven percent uh, inflation so uh, that is a lot if you think seven percent a year for three years that's 21 uh, percent in three years but after that uh, every, everything should normalize and and why all of these things uh, happened is obviously because of covid uh, a lot of su subsidies and grants uh, were pushed on the market and and um, people people got a lot of like uh, support from the government and, and now we have a lot of money on the market. I, I remember the fact that around 20% of uh, US dollars were created in 2020. So again, think about it. It's, it's an enormous amount of money that came uh, to the market. So, I mean, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in one year, two years, three years, maybe it's going to be even worse, but You know, when Estonian uh, president of Estonian banks uh, says that four to seven, you know, it can be uh, even 10 percent inflation. So it depends on how you calculate it. I think <laughs> I've heard on the Internet, if you calculate it like inflation, like in the 70s, we have currently 15 percent. Mm. Uh, but if they, they just adapt the, the way of how to calculate it, so we kind of are like five percent. I don't know. So, and if you if you think about fifteen percent inflation or seven percent inflation, um, and you the typical um, the typ typical expected return of ETFs is kind of seven to eight nine percent, uh, it's not. Uh, it's give you in, in yield basically um, if you consider inflation. So you need to aim for higher <laughs> for higher returns, um, obviously. Um, yeah, so interesting. Um, I hope it's not getting too worse. And I think also we pay just for the pandemic uh, um, by, um, yeah, because money is printed and so on and is losing uh, in value. Um, so maybe asking you one question, what is interesting because um, especially to Selma maybe um, because we have all these platform like Companisto and um, Seedmatch and so on. In the, in the past, so how how is your um, uh, your offering different, and why is it possible right now, and not why is it not has it not been possible to do it like 10 years ago? What are the enabling regulations or technology or yeah? What would you say? You have to unmute. Yeah. That that could be a very long question. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the answer. <laughs> So, um, well, um, we, I mean, the, how we differ from uh, crowdfunding uh, co companies, platforms like Companisto, for example, is that they um, uh, enable retail investors to, to invest in single, in single companies. 
Mm -hmm. That's uh, different with us because we, as an investor, you participate in inventory capital funds, basically. So um, uh, you you um, you uh, benefit from the returns of a whole venture capital fund. That means you basically actually, um, if you if we take the example of Planet A Ventures, which is the current fund on our platform, they um, plan to invest in up to 30 startups. So you will basically have within the fund a diversification of several startup companies um, that you invest in. Because um, one theory or more, one opinion uh, that we have is that it's, difficult to pick one uh, startup or, or one company that will really like outperform every everything else um, and you should rather trust uh, experience a very experienced investment team or experience uh, um, industry as uh, industry experts to make um, this decision for you mm -hmm. um, well so why didn't anyone do this before um, one of the hardest part actually was to build our platform, but also um, developing the financial product. Because um, venture capital is a complex, complex asset class and uh, the regulations in Germany still don't allow retail investors to participate within this asset class. So um, we, 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 we required a, a lot of different standards um, that are still not um, available on the market. And we had to talk, it took us almost a year to come up with a solution. And we were also rejected by a lot of, um, yeah, even uh, industry experts uh, on, on creating this financial product. But we then um, came up basically with the trick that we, uh, yeah, pool the investments and also make an attractive and cheap offering for retail investors by using tokenization. And basically the combination of all these, um, yeah, all, all, all these parts is still unique in this market, but uh, it might not be soon because we're seeing some competitors that tried to move into that, that direction, but we also see that they still didn't go live because it is you really rely on the right partners and industry experts to help you to navigate through this jungle of regulations um, to actually offer a uh, yeah, compliant and legally uh, not risk the product, financial product. So, yeah. so you say your, your asset basically is uh, the financial or the, the regular contractual construction you use and you have figured out that you would say that it's not that easy to copy um, kind of, or at least yeah. not in a in a reasonable time of six months or so. Uh, yeah, so it's it's not impossible. Like we didn't invent all the parts that we mm. use to, to create this financial product. So I would lie if I say we can't be copied, but um, what our USP, what we aimed at our USP is actually the, the the quality and the performance of the funds that we select for the platform, mm. but also the, the educational part, the content that we generate. And um, in the end, also, we want to be a holistic platform for all things venture capital investment. So if someone here hears in venture in five to 10 years, they should be aware they find like all the information and insights and the best uh, and most attractive access to the most attractive startup deals through those funds on our platform. Mm. Um, and and how I mean your your apps I think they're kind of easy pro to produce so I think maybe the yeah, the asset is really in the regulation or in the your partnerships and so on um, because it's just listing listing kind of deals and so on so how would you say uh, Randy and uh, Lena uh, what is how do you maybe defend competitors or how would you say what's your your asset um um, against others? We actually would be very uh, happy to have some competitor because like I said, that there's a lot of marketing that needs to be done. And if we are creating a new asset class, basically an old asset class, but in a, like a new way, obviously we have to change the thinking as well, or the, the way you think of land. So um, also it's very tough um, I would say 
to a lot of competition to appear in, in the land investment crowdfunding section because, uh, you know, land acts in, in, in different countries, land acts under the regulation in, in, in the country, you know, what you have on the legal side, like legislation, yeah. In Estonia, um, we have found a way. Uh, it's, I would say it's not easy, but it's doable. It takes and requires a lot of legal work as well. Um, we work together with two, uh, I would say, best law firms uh, for a couple of months to find the best solution for the land ownership model. Again, this is possible, but this is this is very hard and, and probably going to cost a lot of money for the competitors. So they have to really think through whether they want to establish some company. Uh, obviously, this business model can't be done in, in every country. So whenever we want to you know, expand, um, for instance, that, that can't be done in, in Austria because Austria has a very weird uh, legal system when it comes down to the land and land ownership and, and, uh, and, uh, and all, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, pretty similar. Um, so, yeah, I mean, competition is, is, is we, we, we take it positive and we're kind of, you know, waiting for it. So. Cool. So um, from our side, so we actually do have a competition with Convy, mm -hmm. um, especially because this trend of like fractional ownership in collectibles is also pretty active in the US already. Um, however, the problem, and this is how we want to differentiate, is that like platforms, for example, like Ready Road there in the US, um, and also in Germany, actually, there's a small platform um, called Timeless. What they do is they put uh, smaller assets on the platform. They pre-select them themselves, they purchase them themselves, and then they put it on the platform. Um, and what we do differently is we don't buy the assets ourselves. We are basically, especially in our early days, we're serving as a middleman that connect existing funds or existing partners, existing specialists like the Watch Fund, like Caldwines that are out there that are accessible for very wealthy people already and that have a very strong history and track record we kind of help them open up their doors for retail investors and just like so that these retail investors can start investing with them with just 250 euros instead 10k or 250k even mm -hmm. and um, I think this is what makes Convy also very strong in terms of um, helping people to gain first real returns and um, not having the responsibility to pick the assets themselves. Because if we would pick like, or if you would put like 10 watches on the platform and you as a retail investor still have to pick, okay, which one am I going to now? That's, that's different. But if you have, you know, an expert that, you know, is renowned and like world leading in, in the asset class and that, that expert picks the watch for you, I think that just gives you as like a risk return, a risk reverse, um, Investor just a bit more um, safety to invest with it, um, and we also don't want to to make this whole asset class a gamble. So a lot of these um, platforms like Ready Road, you know, people invest because they're super emotionally about it, and for them it's a gamble. Maybe on a secondary market they want to make like very um, very high short term profit, but that's something that we don't even want to like create like this hype we don't even want to create on our platform we want to rather be like the platform that's more laid back more for risk averse investors and more for investors that want real returns and that have actually pretty secure returns obviously like it's still speculative but it's not we're putting something on a platform maybe it has a negative return like our partners make sure that the return is at least you know pretty good and um this is how we also try to establish these alternative assets in the long term is kind of a no-brainer for everyone to put part of their assets in the portfolio with, or in a portfolio with the collectibles um, because it just makes sense to diversify return-wise and also um, correlation-wise. So you so would also say your asset is kind of the, the partnerships you have and it also lets you maybe scale better uh, when, when you don't have to buy uh, the assets yourself or as a company. Uh, before and maybe um, just with, with a, a quick quick answer, what do people actually own? Because I'm I'm not getting a land kind of in my wallet, or I'm not getting the watch in my my office or at home. So what do do I own, and how can I legally kind of do I have any legal rights uh, about it? 
Uh, because token, is it already accepted <laughs> as a legal thing? So maybe starting with Selma, if you like. Um, yeah, so um, our, our financial product is like correctly described as a tokenized bond security. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people are a little bit um, confused why it's not equity security. The reason behind that is um, that we decided to do so because the, tax, the, the taxes on equity returns are in some higher than on bonds. And um, this way our investors are left with more return in case, of course, the venture capital uh, fund performs very well after all taxes. So that's again, like a little trick that we have done to make it more attractive to retail investors. Um, well, um, it's, I mean, it's, um, what we, what we have to do since we are, um, acting as an institution that issues security to retail investors, we have to work with, um, I don't actually know the, 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 the right English, uh, word for it, but we have to work together with, um, Effecta. It's, it's, it's a liability umbrella, basically, especially for, for companies like us that issue digital assets, retail investors, and we work with them together and they um, make sure that we are compliant also with all regulations and, um, um, and distribute the product according to, to current German laws. Um, interestingly, we don't yet have to be Bafin regulated because um, there's, a, there's a rule that if per, per finance product, if you have less than 8 million assets under management, um, you don't have to be licensed by Baffin. That can, that, that can of course uh, change, um, uh, that can of course change um, in the future, depending on, on how also the Baffin and other financial authorities in Germany and also in Europe um, will yeah, adapt to all this market, um, market developments. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, so um, I hope my, my legal advisor then knows what to ask for. And Lena, uh, what uh, do you have? Um, what is What do I own uh, with you? I don't own maybe the Zeiger in German of the watch or part of the watch, but I, what do I own? You basically we actually own part of the watch um, because like what, how we are set up, we are um, a crowdfunding service provider. And mm -hmm. um, basically if users invest into one of the offerings that is live on the platform, they invest in a separate legal entity. So like a, like a SPV that is spe specifically created to buy, manage, and then sell the asset within the predefined holding period. And if you invest, you become basically a real shareholder of that company that fully owns that watch. So you basically own that watch. And um, that company is also 100% legally independent from Convi, which has this, uh, this great advantage that, I mean, we are a startup and like, especially in the beginning, you know, new fintech people have trust issues, like we have to build trust. But if they invest in this, um, in the assets on the platform, um, because they are legally independent, if something would ever happen to Convi, the, um, they these shareholding companies are um, hundred percent protected from that. So kind of I, I'm a shareholder and uh, own some equity, and you have a one company per uh, VC, f uh, not VC fund. That was less summer, but yeah. per asset. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. And and Renny, what do I own? Uh, it's a it's an asset backed investment. You have mm -hmm. a right for that specific land. Yeah, and what does that mean? Is um, we have for each land we we set the mortgage, and uh, there's a collateral agent that will hold the assets. So it's under our SPV. Uh, basically, Estonian law says that when you want to buy more than ten hectares of land, you need to have a you need to have a special license uh, uh, that's uh, that takes at least three years to get. But we bought one of the one of the companies, and when uh, we start to hold all the lands under the one company, um, and each land uh, each land uh, is is exactly the same way that it's it's protected whenever you know something should happen, even though you know land itself can't can't go bankruptcy. It's it's not possible. You know, someone will buy the land with one euro, uh, but even though we have the collateral agent. Um, and if the company, you know, 
something something happens to Landex, it's the, it's the same way with uh, what Lena said that uh, all the uh, remaining assets will be uh, all the current investors will have a right for those assets that they invested in. So whenever you know should happen something, they start selling the land. Probably with the market price, uh, investors uh, will get their I don't know if their money back. Maybe with the profit, maybe a little bit less, but. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's set with the collateral agent. And you have the right for that specific land. You, you won't own by the registry. You won't, you won't see your name uh, on the registry that you are one of the owners uh, for that land. But what you will see is the name of the SPV. And under the SPV, um, there's, uh, you, you are on the, on, the, on the database or on the list. Okay, so it sounds sounds good, but I think also with the other P2P platforms from, from Estonia, it also sounded it sounds good <laughs> in the past. But um, um, let's see, is Klaus also invest? Can you disclose it? Has he put own money into? Yeah, Klaus. Uh, no, you mean equity or lands? Uh, did Klaus buy some of the land? Yeah, um, Klaus is an active investor there. Klaus, I think. Maybe Klaus, if you want to share your stories on the secondary market, uh, that he made uh, quite a lot of money on the secondary market when it was uh, when it was launched. Because we have the primary market and the secondary mm -hmm. market. On the primary market, we list uh, all the new lands, and uh, um, and then uh, whenever we fund uh, fund the land successfully, mm -hmm. we go to the notary services. We get confirmed uh, by the government or by the by the notary and then people can start selling the land uh, or trading the land. So yeah, Klaus, been, Klaus has been very active. And he's also a shareholder basically, um, yes. kind of. Company. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, what do I else have? Maybe just quickly on, the, uh, on your partnerships because you are kind of startup and uh, you cannot do everything yourself. So I uh, read about uh, Selma, I think uh, that she has, um, Uh, Tangany, uh, so they providing wallets for the tokens you issuing, and then you have Effector as mentioned, yeah. and um, what is the third one? Um, yeah, so yeah, so we use Cashlinks uh, blockchain as a service um, solution to issue and manage all those uh, the digital securities, and for the custody of the digital uh, securities, we are using Tangany exactly. And Apecta is basically our liability partner that we are compliant and um, yeah, do everything under German law and regulations. Cool. And um, Lena, what partner do you partners do you have? So uh, besides, I guess, uh, the partners we're resourcing the assets with, um, for our KYC and AML processes, we, we use uh, BlockPass. And then also um, we have Stripe as our payment service provider. What was yeah. the first one? BlockPass. BlockPass. Okay. And Randy, do you have, you have maybe local agents that are hunting for, for land? Or what uh, no, we don't have local agents, but what we have are the land managers. So. Mm -hmm. um, Great lands are not sold on commercial listing sites, and uh, and uh, by partnering with uh, land managers, we also use land managers to maintain the land or manage the lands. Mm -hmm. um, through land managers, we can get uh, quality quality lands. I would say. Um, also, yes, we're also partnering with uh, with Perif, doing the KYC uh, verification mm -hmm. service. Um, And yeah, with the with the carbon project, we have we have one partnership there, uh, and probably gonna have some more partnerships when it comes down to the, uh, you know, there's like those super apps or super web pages that conclude a lot of uh, different uh, crowdfunding sites. So gonna probably end up partnering with with some of the with some of those uh, pages as well that where they, you know, they take Landex, they take maybe a state guru, Bondora, different uh, crowd mm -hmm. investing sites, and they put it in, into one and uh, and they bring you some traffic. So you mean uh, out there as well, but we have a media, yeah. one media company right now, we partner with them and and let's see. I mean, partnerships, obviously it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, essential part of the business. And then, uh, you know when whenever you are creating a marketplace it requires two things it requires transparency and credibility so mm -hmm. partnership through partnerships you can you can uh, you can get there much faster 
Yeah. And um, now I forgot my question, basically. So you mean aggregators like, uh, um, not estate Google, but was the other estate one? Um, let me check that. Uh, so you mean you want to be listed um, on aggregators like, <laughs> I interviewed them actually a year ago. I forgot it. Anyway, um, going to the next one. So maybe people can also think about questions um, in the audience. If you have questions, just put them into the chat. I will read them out. You also are invited uh, to ask them yourself if you can keep it short uh, or brief. Um, and I would like to ask maybe if you could um, ask one wish to the regulators, what would it be? Uh, let me give you some time to think about it. Maybe one yeah. point I might add before we answer this question, because yes, we already talked about the returns of land and, and uh, yeah luxury mm. goods, but I haven't talked about uh, the returns of ah. the venture capital funds. So, um, so um, according to the Europe Development Venture Capital Fund Index, um, mm. venture, European venture capital funds on average uh, generated... Uh, an annual return of 16.1% mm -hmm. annually. Um, and according, I don't have any comparison to, to land or to, to luxury goods actually, but Pitchbook compared also has like every year or every quarter a report where it also compares venture capital, uh, private equity um, returns to also other asset classes. And it has shown that also venture capital is like the asset class that also out forms as a class like uh, yeah, certain index funds and also uh, real estate actually. And just to give you an example, um, for example, every venture capital fund also aims like for a certain return. Um, um, if you take Planet A Ventures again as a, yeah, as an example to make it more feasible in an optimistic scenario, they aim for an annual, um, annual return of over 20% per year, actually. And um, they have about a 10 year maturity. And considering that, um, if you invest in Planet, uh, if you, um, yeah, um, if you buy a, a, a token of uh, Planet A Ventures, um, after all costs, your um, initial investment amount of money uh, more than triples in an optimistic scenario. So you just have like a, a, a ratio how how well uh, venture capital as an asset class can perform, mm -hmm. but of course yeah. it's also very risky asset class. But we and, know. Yeah, disclaimer of course. And um, I've seen that you kind of in, invest start investing, and then they have a, I think a four year period these startups where they don't have to pay out, and then you get your twenty percent or whatever this um, payout would be. And then after a period, it's getting sold by the VC fund. By the yeah, VC I mean, it, it, it always depends on the timeline of the respective fund. So there's the first period of a venture capital fund is always fundraising the money. Mm. This can take up to like, this can actually for fund, some funds take up to, should takes up like to six to 12 months. The second period is about like investing all the money into distributing the money to all the startups. And the last period is actually where you maybe make also follow up investments in some certain startups, but um, actually, yeah, help those startups to establish themselves more in the market and then actually generate returns through their hopefully exponential growth of some certain startups in the portfolio, but also by selling it to maybe larger corporation or even some going public. Yeah, and um, so in the and um, if I would like invest in three startups in crowdfunding platform, then I would not have a good return maybe. Or this, um, this number you mentioned, is it also taking in consideration the defaults of startups? So is it really? Uh, yeah, it's like, okay. it's the, I mean, it's the, the, yeah, exactly. It's not too bad. And even after fees, because I think, uh, I mean, the statistic you mentioned maybe is for institutional investors or for, the VCs, but I think also um, your company is uh, also taking a cut and some fees and so that maybe there's a little less for the retail investors on, on your platform. I mean, what I said, the scenario with Planet A Ventures is actually a scenario that was tailored to retail investors. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Um, <clears throat> maybe we can also put the link in the show notes, at least for the podcast, because I'm interested in the statistics. Um, I have to say goodbye to somebody. <laughs> Um, okay, and um, so one question from the audience, maybe to uh, wrap it slowly up, how do you handle the uncertainty and valuation of the alternative assets and try to generate trust for the users so that they are confident regarding their investment? Um, um, from Wolfgang Schmidt, uh, probably German. Um, okay. So you can answer it, Randy, if you like. Yeah. Um... Of course, that's uh, one key part of, of investing. And when it comes down to the land valuation as well, one thing is we can look at the you know, market prices uh, as, as uh, you know, Estonia is a very digitalized country where every, every like, service is on the internet and we can see very briefly or very accurately what are the, are the prices, but we can never uh, rely on them. So what we do is we do two things. We do our own uh, evaluation model and we... Uh, have our own land board that consists of four people and four experts uh, that are in the field. We always have to have, uh, uh, we always have to agree 100%. So whenever someone says, no, I'm, I don't agree on this or that, then we are uh, dropping the, the topic or we're, we're gonna you know, discuss uh, even more. But um, that's the one thing. The another thing is since, um, we have we used land managers and those land managers have 10 20 25 years of experience we can always um, and and they are in the process of evaluating the land as well uh, we can always show them the returns um, of our land managers that's the that's the one case that i'm, I'm currently onboarding one high net worth individual and uh, you know he asked the same same thing what I did is uh, I showed with your money, we're going to have that land manager um, and he's in the process of ev evaluation of e evalu evaluating the land and his returns has been 20, 21% uh, annually. So it makes a lot of sense. And that's basically the only way we can really prove you the, the right uh, you know, valuation or at, at the moment, I can give you the, on, on the land valuation uh, one more perspective. We want to try out also land loans. So let's say you're a farmer, you want to, have, you get, you want to get a loan. Uh, it's pretty hard. Or it's basically impossible to get a loan from the bank because banks, they need to manage their risks and they evaluate your land a lot of times up to 50% cheaper because they don't know the current valuation and they're not really having a good model when it comes down to the evaluation or any risk matrices or anything like that. So what we are doing is we're doing our own model at first and also relying on the, on the land manager's um, uh, returns. Maybe just also quickly jumping in here just for, for Convy, so how we do that, because I think it's a very valid question. Um, so we will always refer to the RRP, which is the recommended retail price of, for example, the watches. And we also intend to buy the watches brand new. So our partner is able to, to often get them directly from the manufacturers so we can compare their value first with an authenticator, but then also secondly with the RRP. So they have, especially like when the item is bought, like a solid comparison on like on what price what watch was, was bought for and um, how much it's worth compared to like the, the rec recommended retail price. And then when it's sold after like a certain period of time, it's um, sold to collectors um, trying to obviously get the best price. So, okay, maybe then uh, to, to add from my part. So, valuating venture, like the, the, the progress or the growth of um, single startups in a venture capital portfolio, it's difficult. It's very complex. So, it's definitely currently also a challenge of ours how we will, yeah, demonstrate the reporting once uh, someone um, acquired a, a token of a fund. Um, because, for example, it's usual that venture capital funds actually make negative returns in the first couple of years because they're just spending the money into startups. They believe in that they will grow in the last few years. So um, 
one on the one hand we want to make it like also the, these developments very transparent and also more explore how we can make it like transparent also in a less scary way uh, together with the VC funds that we are working with. So um, yeah, but there's actually not one solution currently on the market. So that's something that we have to build ourselves and showcase ourselves. Cool. And um, Zelma, would you invest in watches with Lena or would you say it's too risky? I already registered on the Conny platform. I just wanted to say. <laughs> I also registered on Convi platform, but I also wanted to register on the two others. Um, but then my coffee cup was empty. So I will do that at the weekend. Um, that was also a provocative question. So I would like to wrap it up. Uh, I have a ton of more questions. If you have, for example, secondary markets and so on, but that's for next time. Um, my, my colleague in the back end, the Jan, wanted to also say one minute about uh, something. Jan, are you ready? Uh, yes. Hi. Cool. Um, yeah. So, do you have a slide for me or not? No. No, I don't. Okay. Have... Cool. Um, so, thank you very much. Very interesting uh, input and topics. Uh, I learned a lot because, like, I'm not uh, the investment guru. So, thank you. And also, as a as a thank you for you for your speakers, but also for the participants in this round, uh, I would like to offer you that uh, if you have any interesting story. Uh, to share, uh, let let us know, Matthias and me, we will put it into our FinTech Weekly newsletter, which is a newsletter with over 20,000 subscribers worldwide. So take the chance to share everything with us, but which helps you to grow and to, uh, yeah, to, 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 to make you more, uh, more uh, visible, uh, even if you don't, if you don't allow to make advertisements uh, internationally from germany so you just so we've we've we found the story at the end so like uh, it's not your fault then and um yeah so this is like an offer for you and uh yeah we will put this video online in the next day so feel free to share we kindly ask you and also as we mentioned we want to grow a bit so like fintech meetup cologne will turn into fintech meetup europe so like we uh working on a, a rebranding right now so please share this meetup with your friends, with your colleagues. It would be cool to have more and more international people and diverse people here in this virtual room. And also coming to the next meetup. So the next meetup is on January 21st. Um, yeah, here in Zoom. So this is what I wanted to say to you and thank you and have a nice evening. Yeah, you can um, also sign up on meetup currently um, and the Eventbrite link will go to LinkedIn. Uh, soon um thanks for uh, thanks a lot for coming and also uh, for everybody also putting questions into the chat for listening i think we we have still 80 people here although we asked um de very detailed questions and yeah uh, please also share the video um the youtube video that is um, being available i think latest on monday uh, with your your peers and i hope they can also subscribe to the youtube channel and the newsletter and so on so thank you very much uh, bye bye stay at the call if you like but if not um, i'm stopping the recording right now see you bye bye, bye.